Good morning uh, uh, or good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. We have people joining us from across time zones, uh, Japan and the East Coast of Australia. Uh, my name is Dhruva Jayashankar. I am the Executive Director of the Observer Research Foundation America. Uh, ORF America was established last year in Washington, D.C. as a partner of ORF, one of India's leading public policy institutes. We're very pleased to be hosting this public panel discussion today uh, with the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. Uh, NSCAI's final report was made public a few months ago and promises to set the stage for the US uh, United States AI policies in the years ahead. Uh, this is also a timely discussion because of renewed interest in the Quad, uh, the grouping comprised of Australia, India, Japan, and the United States, uh, following their leadership level summit in March. Uh, among other things, uh, the Quad leaders agreed to establish a working group on critical and emerging technologies, uh, which is now met. Before turning to our excellent panel, which consists of officials from all four Quad countries, as well as from the NSCAI, let me just uh, briefly turn to Ili Bajrakari, uh, who is Executive Director of NSCAI, for his introduction. Over to you, Ili. Thank you, Dhruva, so much. Uh, good morning, morning, everybody. Uh, it's, it's a great day to be here with all of you on this uh, on this uh, event. I'm uh, Bharatwari, as Dhruva said, and I serve as the, as the executive director of the National, National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. Uh, National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence created almost, almost three years ago with, with the goal to analyze and provide recommendations to Congress and the White House on methods and means necessary to advance the development of AI national security and defense needs of our country. When we started the commission, we wanted to create partnerships across uh, the board with respected institutions, private sector, and academia. And it was a no-brainer for us to reach my old friend, Druva, for the incredible opportunity to partner with ORF uh, in the last two years and work, work together on these important issues. I also want to, re want to recognize two other individuals on the team today, Jason Mini, who served, served as a key a commissioner on February, and led all our efforts regarding allies and partner partners that reflected in our, in our final report that Druva mentioned we published on March 1st. Also, Gil and Louis, uh, one of our most uh, active commissioners, I would say, who has played an, an instrumental role in the tone and the recommendations we have in our report regarding international partnerships. The topic of, of the discussion has been at the center of the work of the commission that we have done in, done in the last two years. Partnerships is one of the, the key themes that comes out throughout our, our report. Our missions were cl clear, gave us a clear, clear guidance to that. We're in a global techno-economic petition. America's allies and partners are critical advantage for our competitors, and we need to bring together all the new, new apps. The Quad is one of these formats that can help expand our cooperation and partnerships in the areas of emerging technologies. So I look forward to the conversation we will have today. And again, I want to thank all the panelists across many time zones joining us for this important discussion. I turn it over to you, Druva. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ili, and thank you for partnering with us on this. We have a great panel with us today. Um, I'll just briefly introduce them before turning to them for some questions. Um, we will have some time at the end of this session for uh, questions and answers from the audience. Uh, please type in your questions and I'll uh, be reviewing them as uh, the panelists speak. Hopefully we'll have time to get to a few of them at the end of this hour long session. Um, let me first introduce uh, Jason Matheny. He recently joined the White House. He has a very uh, unique job. He's dual hatted with the National Security Council and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, Takatoshi Miura is Deputy Director General at Japan's Ministry for Ec Economy, Trade and Industry, or METI, better known as METI. Uh, he joins us from Tokyo, a very late hour for him, and thank you for joining us. Uh, amongst many other things, he oversees AI policy, uh, and, and, and as we'll discuss, it's a growing, an area of growing importance for his, uh, his uh, department and, and uh, his organization. Uh, Anna Roy is a Senior Advisor to Niti Aayog, uh, which is the Indian government's in-house think tank. Uh, and has been instrumental also in, uh, uh, in uh, developing India's uh, approach to artificial intelligence. Uh, Tobias Fikin, uh, who has just joined us uh, and is perhaps the latest up amongst all of the, the people here, uh, is Australia's cyber ambassador, another unique position uh, that tells you also the in diplomacy as well for countries. Uh, and a final is 
uh, the, uh, and, and uh, major contributor to the NSCAI report. Uh, Gilman has a, a fascinating background that includes a, a video game designer, amongst many other things, uh, and now uh, runs his, uh, uh, his own firm. Um, I'm going to start off, uh, let me turn first to Jason. Um, how would you describe uh, the incoming Biden administration's approach and where does AI fit into this strategy? Thanks, Truva. I um, at first, I'm so grateful to see so many friends on on one participant list. I'm just looking down the screen right now, and it just makes me really happy to be starting out the day this way. Um, I'm also grateful to those who are ending the day this way uh, and joining across so many time zones. Um, so first, I have been deeply impressed by how much the Biden-Harris administration is sincere about its commitment uh, to working with our allies and partners, uh, and particularly the Quad, uh, to rebuild and strengthen the science and technology partnerships that form the foundation of our modern economy. Um, the focus on partnerships runs through every policy I've seen at the White House since arriving here. Uh, this administration is focused on getting real work done with you and making progress on our global challenges, from our collective security challenges to ending this pandemic and preventing future pandemics, to the threats from authoritarianism, climate change, and addressing the persistent challenge of poverty, of disease, hunger, and inequality. Science and technology partnerships among all of us here are going to be critical to making progress uh, against those challenges. Um, second, I recommend reading the AI Commission's report. It was such a privilege to work with Illy and Gilman and the rest of the Extraordinary Commission team over the last couple of years. Uh, our report is long, but it's it's worth the time reading, not only for its insights on, on AI policy, uh, but it's thinking about technology st strategy broadly and uh, technology partnership. Um, if nothing else, do a keyword search for quad and the report, and you'll see some great recommendations. One recommendation I wanna highlight is to build on the Quad framework and negotiate a formal AI-related cooperation agreement that emphasizes AI uh, interoperability. Um, third, I wanna point people here to AI.gov, which is a website that Lynn Parker and her great team uh, here in the AI Coordination Office at the White House launched earlier this year. It has links to a range of valuable resources that I think will be of interest uh, to those who are working on AI policy. Um, and fourth and last, I want to highlight one area in AI where the U.S. would like to invite much greater level of investment and cooperation uh, within the Quad, and that's privacy-preserving machine learning. Um, it's, it's often been pointed out that current AI systems uh, could offer a, a asymmetric advantage to authoritarian regimes, since current AI systems benefit from having large data sets and benefit from having a data set that is centrally managed. Uh, but we can build AI systems that are democracy affirming um, by addressing each of those advantages. We can invest in low shot learning methods that learn from smaller volumes of data. And we can also invest in methods that uh, work on distributed uh, and or encrypted data. So one of the things that I would love as a follow-on discussion is how collectively uh, we can join in building privacy-preserving machine learning methods at scale. Back to you, Riva. Thank you very much. Uh, let me turn to uh, our colleagues from Japan, uh, Miura uh, Takatoshi. Uh, Miura-san, um, uh, can you briefly uh, describe uh, Japan's general AI strategy? What are some objectives and initiatives that uh, are uh, relevant to the context of the Quad? Sure. Uh, good morning or good evening, everybody. I would like to express my uh, gratitude to uh, for the invitation this uh, to this uh, round table. I'm honored to be here, and I look forward to exchange constructive ideas with you all. First of all, I would like to make sure that we are all in the same boat. AI is a fundamental and important technology. AI can improve our quality of life. AI enable a new way of mobility service. AI is so crucial that it defines technology competitiveness and even economic power. At the same time, AI is so 
versatile that it can be deployed in a manner that we don't prefer. For example, AI for mass surveillance. In general, we, we confront a basic issue, uh, which is how to maximize benefit of AI and minimize negative impact of AI, not only uh, domestically, but also internationally. Governments around the world worked hard to identify most important basic values on AI, and the effort was uh, culminated in the OECD and G20 AI principles. I believe the Japanese basic value on AI are well aligned with those of the OECD countries. With various inputs from experts, the government of Japan decided social principle of human-centric AI in March 2019 with three visions, which are one, dignity, two, diversity and inclusion, and three, sustainability. It also finds seven AI principles, one, human-centric, two, education and literacy, three, privacy protection, four, ensuring security, five, fair competition, six, um, fairness, uh, accountability and transparency, and seven, innovation. Now, uh, let's go back to the basic issue, how to maximize bene benefit of AI and minimize negative impacts caused by use of AI internationally. The NASCAR report uh, devotes one chapter to the uh, favorable international technology order. The government of Japan shares the idea that we must work hand in hand with allies and partners to promote the use of emerging technologies to strengthen the democratic norms and values. It is time to uh, spread our norms and values to as many countries as possible, I think. And let me briefly overview Japanese, Japan's AI strategy. And the in Integrated Innovation Strategy Promotion Council, uh, chaired by Chief Cabinet Secretary and Minister of science and technology decided a social principle of human-centric AI in March 2019 and under the guidance of the principles. The Council decided the first comprehensive AI strategy in June 2019 with the three visions of one, dignity, two, diversity and inclusion, and three, sustainability. The Council set four strategic targets, one, human resources, two, deployment to real world, three, technologies for inclusion, and four, international cooperation. We can conceive a couple of aspects of international cooperation uh, from high level principles to uh, practical guidance and R&D cooperation. The AI strategy identifies global partnership on AI, or GPAY, as an important uh, practical international framework initiative it is important because members share basic values such as democracy, freedom, diversity, and innovation. As a steering committee member of GPA, the government of Japan is leading in shaping this young initiative with Australia, India, and the United States to promote the use of AI technology to strengthen democratic norms and values. I think that Quad is also an important forum for international cooperation on AI. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for, the, for that overview. And it's interesting to see some of the parallels with the uh, US's development recently of, of its uh, uh, AI policy. Um, may I turn to uh, uh, Anna Roy from India, uh, Mr. Roy. Um, India is undergoing major transformations um, in some ways accelerated by the pandemic. Um, what role do you see for AI in India's reform agenda going forward? Oh, and I think you'll have to get off mute. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share the India vision of uh, AI. Um, I would like to take you back uh, to 2018 when we released our strategy. Niti Ayo released the India strategy on AI. Uh, and that will essentially explain, you know, the philosophy behind it, what we exactly did uh, at that time. That will explain what we are doing today. And uh, here, basically, um, uh, you know, when we started uh, in 2018, uh, we were, uh, Niti Ayok was asked to come out with this strategy for the country. At that time, a handful of countries had already released their strategy. 
but there was a buzz globally so other countries were also really uh, uh, somewhere out there but uh, they were not out with a strategy uh, quote and quote uh, so that was the first thing about uh, the global space uh then uh, uh, we also kind of um, discussed uh, the various other uh, uh, you know issues uh, available uh, at that time uh, first of all uh, we realized that uh, what was happening uh, in in india the reform, whatever we do in the space of technology it has to align uh, with uh, the reform agenda the reform agenda of the government was uh, premised on inclusive growth so we uh, that was one of the cornerstones that whatever we recommend as a strategy for use of ai it has to be pegged with uh, the uh, overall philosophy of inclusive growth uh, we realized that there were um, three major key levers in any ai uh, program it is really data compute and uh, the uh, you know tools development through a robust uh, r&d ecosystem we also examined what was happening in other countries like the us uk germany and the systems they were uh, putting in place uh, to uh, break out uh, the uh, you know the uh, implementing uh, their ai strategies um, and uh, you know from some secondary research we realized that uh, uh, adoption of ai was still driven at that time and i don't think much has changed till now though there is some move in the other sectors as well by cons uh, commercial considerations so sectors like uh, health education where, wherever you know there were uh, more public goods uh, there we did not see much of activity at least at that time and it was a published report by uh, mckenzie and company uh, which we uh, referred to uh, and that was uh, one of the things uh, uh, which we felt that you know should be uh, uh, used to guide what the government's role should be uh, in india per se we had the sectors like agri health education which were uh, facing their own specific challenges in agri the weather remained unpredictable the processing uh, industry you know was weak so leading to a lot of wastages a uh, use of inputs was not really optimum uh, in healthcare the access was a problem affordability was a problem um and uh, a sizable part of the population still faced uh, with a lot of uh, lack of uh, proper health care especially in remote areas education also the uh, learning outcomes uh, were a issue retention rates were a problem availability of good uh, teachers was also there so access uh, remained a major problem uh, especially in a country like india with uh, such scale and diversity Uh, the economic uh, potential was immense there were several studies which uh, kind of indicated what ai can do for the country so in this kind of a landscape uh, 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 and uh, given the overall reform agenda of the government we came out with a strategy and called it ai for all that is using the technology uh, which uh, uh, benefits the larger segment of the uh, society and also the concept of um, uh, human in the loop that is whatever uh, technology we use that uh, uh, kind of uh, helps in uh, improving the productivity of the uh, uh, populace and not replace like there, there is a replacement no doubt in many segments but to the extent possible uh, it should be a human in the loop kind of a uh, uh, approach to, uh, that we recommended uh, with this uh, we uh, released the national strategy on ai uh, which identified five different sectors including health education and agriculture uh, where we said that uh, the government should play the key key role in other sector we felt that uh, we should not crowd out the private sector which may be doing a good job uh, developing the ecosystem um, uh, to cover the entire value chain and ensure that applied research is given equal importance a guided innovation through clear roles of government and forging collaborations a uh, democratizing access to in, uh, infrastructure as well as a, a deployment of solutions and ensure responsible use of ai that uh, you know ethics and other issues were highlighted and last but not the least collaborations both uh, among stakeholders within the country and also globally 
so these were the major uh, kind of you know uh, facts uh, on which uh, we gave the recommendations we continue to implement that strategy uh, we are dealing with scaling up issues procurement issues scaling infrastructure at different fora uh, the pandemic has kind of i would say uh, kind of expedited uh, this uh, process so we are now following a platform approach and we are developing technology commons in major sectors where it can help data remains an important issue and how to collect data at, at scale and how to make data accessible good data accessible to the larger community given the robust uh, innovation ecosystem of india and addressing the digital divide as well so that democratizing you know the access to infrastructure as well as access to the tools uh, on all these uh, fronts we are working several initiatives whether it is uh, uh, platforms in uh, you know ag agriculture health health is uh, has taken the uh, has come in the forefront because of the pandemic but the other sectors are not being ignored they are also uh, we are uh, following this particular strategy in uh, promoting ai i'll just spend uh, 30 seconds on the global uh, Uh, collaboration which we spoke about in the strategy especially since it's a quad uh, conference today so we gave this concept of ai garage for 40% of the world we said that if you solve for india you actually mean you are solve for 40% or more of the world uh, because india provides a perfect playground for enterprise and institutions globally to develop scalable solutions which can be easily implemented in the rest of the developing and emerging uh, uh, economies uh, we also uh, kind of worked uh, on this concept and shared concept notes we are working with several countries on these lines we have niti aayog has a partnership with the treasury in australia also with uh, meti in japan we have kind of exchanged some uh, views so uh, uh, in the nutshell this is what you know ai for all or in or inclusive growth that is using technology to further the reform agenda of the government to improve the governance that is what we are doing and uh, uh, during the pandemic that is the line which we have taken really going forward thank you and and, and since you mentioned australia and the partnership with them it's uh, uh, turning over to uh, to ambassador by speaking um, you have a, a a very interesting portfolio that covers a lot of technological issues but could you maybe uh, start us off by uh uh briefly describing what australia's approach to ai has been we've heard from the other countries yeah sure i'll i'll do something uh which isn't on the international side i'll i'll discuss a little bit what we're doing domestically and i think we've been as as many of the other speakers have um and been been talking about i think every country is going through um a, a lot of uh, recognition of what ai brings to their economies um because we've been doing so much policy work of late uh, our most recent estimates uh whether the greater adoption of ai and automation technologies and the digital innovation that will be spun out spun out um and enabled by ai will add about 315 billion dollars to the australian economy by 2028 um and certainly for us that that has led um to the prime minister actually on 6th of may this year releasing um our digital economy strategy and through that um to make the most of of what these technologies will will enable um there's uh, the government's investing almost 1.2 billion dollars australian dollars um to try and ensure that our future um uh, really is uh, uh digital as far as possible by 2030 and make the most of those estimates of what what these technologies will bring to our our economy um as part of that strategy there's four new measures that we've put in place to try and build our ai capability um and we'll provide uh, the meat on the bones of a forthcoming ai action plan which isn't released yet but it's in in motion currently inside government but those four things um we're creating a national ai center for and four ai and digital capability centers which will bring together ai researchers industry um and support businesses in australia to adopt and use ai technologies and and make sure that that we're fast adopters we traditionally are um quick to absorb new technologies but we want to ensure that these technologies are getting into the hands of businesses as quickly as possible um the second of these initiatives is investing in ai based solutions to national challenges um and trying to provide opportunities for public private partnership to develop better ai based solutions to some of um, australia's grand challenges if you will um we 
would be pretty some pretty interesting announcements around that when when that comes through. And then thirdly, um, uh, we we have developed um, industry co-funded next generation AI graduates program um, to attract and train homegrown job ready AI specialists. I mean, I, I'm sure pretty much everyone on this call on a daily basis in their discussions will be um, examining ways in which we can get skilled workers into um, as quickly as possible into the working environment with, with the right skills. Um, it's, uh, we find that whether it's in cybersecurity and AI skills um, stem across the board, uh, it's, it's uh, causing, I think, many countries headaches right now. And the fourth of these um, initiatives is to try and, to try and cat catalyze the AI opportunity um, in our region, uh, we're, we're looking at community-based partnership grants that bring together AI practitioners uh, with regional businesses and communities to try and solve local challenges internationally. Um, and through that, you will see an, an AI action plan that will come to fruition shortly. Um, and it's been you know, developed over several years of investment from the Australian government through an AI capability fund which included an AI technology roadmap, AI ethics framework, and AI standards roadmap. And I do think when we get to the international side, um, I'll just talk a little bit more about what we do domestically and then pause to see uh, if we get into that international discussion a bit more clearly. But I think on the standard side, that's somewhere where we've got to be really sharp-eyed in terms of how we engage. And, and I think the Quad certainly has a lot to offer there. Um, just on uh, what Australia is doing on AI ethical principles, um, alongside all of the, the kind of proactive business side um, and trying to stimulate uh, our AI uh, ecosystem here. We've also been very active in trying to build public trust for AI as well, which we all know is one of the fundamental issues in our societies. Um, at, and in November 2019, reasonable amount of time ago now, um, our government released our AI ethical principles to encourage organizations to practice the highest standards of responsible governance when developing and using AI. And that, that uh, would mimic, I'm sure, many of the, the similar principles that have already been discussed. Um, and part of that also includes ensuring there's appropriate data and AI systems security measures in place. And that includes identifying potential vulnerability to cybersecurity risks, ensuring AI systems are resilient to those adversarial attacks and operate reliably um, as were intended by their designers. Um, but also encouraging those designers to be designing with ethical principles in mind um, and um, something I think that's really important when we get into the international part of this discussion is having um, a conversation and, and looking at values in the tech space and in the AI space. But the voluntary principles um, uh, that, that we came up with were informed and, and in consultation and co-design um, with a whole range of, of industry partners and, and non-governmental organizations. And it's already been piloted by six businesses, our Commonwealth Bank, AIG, National Australia Bank, Telstra, Microsoft, and Flamingo AI. Um, and the, the learnings from those case studies are going to be published in uh, later on this year. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of learning there for everyone. So anyway, I'll pause there. Um, that's, that's in a nutshell, the kind of Australia... Uh, domestic picture and some of what's going on. There's a whole host of things going on in the international arena on the quad as well. Perhaps I can get into that a little bit later and give everyone else a chance now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, it's very interesting to hear the parallels from the four countries and, uh, and the areas of emphasis um, uh, from, from all of them. Let me turn to Gildan uh, Louis. Um, you, you know, you, you've served as a commissioner now on NSCI. Can you give an overview of NSCI's final report and so particularly its recommendations for furthering international cooperation around AI and, and emerging technologies. Sure, more than happy to. First of all, uh, it, uh, it's really an exciting time for, for the Quad. Uh, Jason, Illy, and, and I, and many other commissioners thought often about the strategic competitive landscape and, and the number of times the Quad came up in our discussions. Uh, it, it was always, um, what's our answer, guys? You know you know, let's use alliances. Let's look at the quad as the model to move forward with. So I, I think it's important for us to understand, um, particularly for those who are uh, willing to dive into our 751 page bedside reading on uh, the context in which we wrote this report. Uh, the commission is a, well, it's a two year old commission focusing in on areas to make the US competitive. And why is that important? Why was it suddenly a matter of national security and national interest that we needed to do this. I think the first judgment 
that we had as a commission was that the U.S. was not ready um, to compete in a new era when you against a strong and committed competitor who has announced a timeline and the willingness to use a whole of nation approach to win in the, as some would say, the fourth industrial revolution driven by key technologies, particularly around AI. So what we attempted to do was lay out not only a strategy, but a, a, a competitive timetable. And we had to also understand the context of that timetable. Um, China had back in 2016 created a framework on um, where and how they were going to march out. They set a series of internal goals for timelines. They wanted to be competitive with the West by 2025 in AI. They wanted to be able to have superior AI by 2030. They wanted to have dominant AI by 2035. And then on the military front, be able to fight in any domain anywhere in the world by 2049 and win. So that set the timetable. Um, and then we as a country had to make a decision whether or not we were gonna be responsive, whether we would stay on a particular path that we were on, or do we have to adjust our strategy? So our second takeaway that, that we became very adamant on was to set a hard deadline of 2025. And we said that by 2025, the US had to be able to defend and compete in the coming era of AI accelerated competition and conflict. So we broke up our report to two parts. The first part was focused around defending America and defending, working with our allies to, to strengthen their defense uh, against the use of technologies empowered by AI um, that could compromise our democracies. And the second part was, how do we win this um, strategic competition? Now, when we look at the US, and you have to understand this report was, well, it was US centric. We were also thinking about how it could become a framework for like-minded democracies. And, and we came up with four pillars for action. And, and these four pillars um, would probably really serve as a, a guidepost for the quad and, and, and other countries as well. So the first part of the pillar of the strategy was the such of leadership. And in the US leadership starts with the White House. And so one of the things that we recommended was putting together a technology competitive council uh, at the White House and to organize the Department of Defense and our intelligence community around defending our country and winning the technology competitions. The second area, which, which all the speakers have talked about, is the importance of talent. And we realize that we have a huge talent deficit and we're not just talking about STEM engineers, uh, programmers, uh, hardware folks who build the foundations of AI, but the talent to actually use AI in machine human teaming to actually um, accelerate our ability to either defend, ability to produce economic goods and services and to protect our people. Now underlying AI, uh, as important as algorithms and data are, uh, a key strategic advantage the West has is quite frankly, our ability to do microelectronics and its hardware. At the core of com competitive strategic advantage in AI, besides the talent, is the hardware. Because most of the algorithms are, are going to be uh, shared, it's generated in kind of open source communities, and we think that's good. But the hardware, the ability to process large amounts of information and, dis and create decision advantage is driven by hardware. And we're, that hardware, that, that microelectronics vulnerability as it currently exists in our current supply chains is only 110 miles away from a threat to take that away. And so we had to think about our ability to stay ahead in hardware to distribute that supply chain and to make sure that we're always two generations ahead of China's ability to produce faster, more efficient and more capable pieces of electronics. And of course, the fourth area is innovation. Without innovation, without the investments in R&D, 
We cannot stay ahead, nor can we nurture the next generation of researchers. So we took international partnerships very seriously, and we focused in on the importance of partnerships and the responsible development and use of these technologies. And to do so, the United States cannot merely do it by itself. It needs partners. It needs to create a dialogue. It needs to take the resources of like-minded nations, right? And work together to set up an alternative series of standards that reflects our democratic values rather than the values of authoritarian states. And show the world not only the safe and appropriate and trusted uses of these technologies, but use, making sure these technologies are not used to undermine our countries or our individual freedoms. So we strongly point out in the report that these threats are real, right? When we, when we use AI, it is an accelerant to all the other technologies that we apply it against. So we take AI, put against malign information, the ability to manipulate, the ability to find seams in your defenses, the ability to coerce and to do it in a covert way, the ability to promote corruptions, it can all be accelerated with AI. So we need to use AI also to defend against those situations. So let me get down very quickly um, before I turn it back to the rest of the speakers on specific international recommendations that we made in a report. And I wanna put this in the context of kind of this great uh, era of competition. We look at China, we, we have a strong respect for the Chinese and what they have done particularly over the last 50 years in raising their economy, right? They, they are very, very focused on re-emerging as a global leader, right? The, the situation is the conflict comes between uh, the way we do it in the democracies and the way that an authoritarian state may do it. And so um, as powerful as China is, it still only represents on the GDP side, 17% 70, of the GDP. If we take this quad and ignore the rest of the world, the quad represents 35% of the world's GDP. So if we work together, we can serve not only the foundation for leading other democratic nations forward in this era of competition, but we will also have the resources to do so. So we have four basic components of our international strategy. The first one was to build an emerging technology coalition called the ETC with key allies and partners and, and all the countries on this call are represented by that. Second, launch an international digital democracy initiative. Force the discussion around how these technologies need to be used to embrace democratic values. Third, develop a holistic plan to support international efforts and the fourth area is to create a emerging tech resource hub for research to allow our researchers to work together and quite frankly, leverage the technologies that are necessary to really do cutting edge AI research. This is not for the faint of heart. Most individuals, most countries don't have millions of cores to throw against a particular problem. But if we work together, create that hub, we can really, really move the ball forward on innovation and stay ahead in this great strategic competition um, that we've talked about. Well, thanks, uh, uh, Gilman, for, for bringing so many different strands together and tying it into the, uh, you know, we've heard from some of the other speakers and tying it into the NSCAI report. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna have a quick another round of questions um, to, all, uh, to uh, the other panelists. Uh, to either get into a bit more detail about your country's policies or in some ways talk about, as, as Tobias said, the sort of international element of, of, their, uh, of, of their viewpoint. So uh, Mira-san, uh, you represent Japan's METI. What are some of the METI specific initiatives uh, under Japan's general strategy? For example, with regards to improving AI governance, AI standards and research infrastructure, for example, that was some of the issues that Gilman brought up. Sure. I think it's always better to go back to the basic issue on AI, which is how to maximize benefit of AI and minimize negative impacts caused by use of AI. Medi is proposing a general governance framework 
to maximize a uh, fruit of innovation and so uh, to minimize negative impact caused by emerging technologies. It is called agile governance. Medi discussed with stakeholders for two years to establish the framework, published two report, uh, reports in Japanese and English. Both reports um, captured a lot of attention around the world. In the March, in this March, uh, our second report uh, got more than 10,000 access from all over the world with in only two weeks from the release of English version with a lot of supportive comments. The key message of Agile Governance is that we should make rulemaking, monitoring and enforcement processes more flexible, swift and cooperative. We all know that we need some rules to manage risks of emerging technology. However, there are always possibility that rules hinder innovation, especially um, prescri pre prescribed rules are likely to kill innovation while not being successful in managing new type of risks. This kind of governance gap can be overcome with agility. A government should set goals and make guidance to achieve the goal with multi-stakeholders, ask them to explain how they achieve the goals and update the guideline with, uh, sorry, uh, update the guideline with uh, feedbacks from multi-stakeholders in a timely manner. That is the basic concept of, of agile governance. Currently, Medi is applying it to AI and drafting AI governance guidelines. It will be published in a month or so. It is designed to help companies respect uh, AI principles in a more coordinated manner. So, and R&D is another area that many focuses on. As I mentioned earlier, deployment to the real world is one of our strategic target. In particular, I believe that we can contribute to the global community by promoting initiatives in area where Japan has strength, such as materials or manufacturing. AI has becoming AI has become an important technology in the field of materials, such as material informatics and process informatics. Material informatics is for developing new material. Process informatics is for searching manufacturing processes. I think that materials are crucial for robust supply chain. One of the target in this project of processing informatics is spar high performance um, ceramics for electronic equipment, equipment for beyond 5G systems. Japan is working hard to play a key role in state-of-the-art state technology. So at NIS, and to be supported by uh, enabling technology, one of which is semiconductor. So MIDI supports R&D for AI chips, promoting innovation in advanced semiconductor manufacturing technology through in international co cooperation between in enterprises, achieving the green innovation by using you know, innovative materials for power semiconductors and strengthening design technologies of advanced uh, logic semiconductor. MIDI launched a committee on semiconductor and digital industry strategy this March. The committee aims to examine structural change in the semiconductor industry and economic security environment. Many of the issues discussed are not specifically relevant to AI, but they will be likely relevant to the uh, larger context of quad. Based on discussions, Medi published semiconductor digital industry strategy last week, so, and we will be happy to share the strategy at uh, similar occasions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, who, uh, Ms. Roy, um, India's government, and you mentioned your remarks, you stressed the importance of responsible AI. 
how do you define responsible AI and what is the potential there for international cooperation in that area? Uh, so through basically, uh, you know, the, uh, in the India's national strategy for AI, as I said, it was premised on AI for all. And uh, the strategy actually brought the issues of ethics and responsible AI center straight uh, by drilling down the emphasis on how important it is for everyone involved in AI research, development, as well as deployment to ensure inclusive and beneficial growth of AI. Uh, act, uh, and uh, Honorable Prime Minister of India, uh, Shri Modi, also kind of, uh, you know, underlined uh, when in his address to uh, the uh, WEF earlier this year, uh, he uh, stated that uh, we need to make sure that technology becomes the tool of ease of living and not a trap. So even uh, our, uh, you know, senior leadership recognizes uh, uh, the uh, flip side of uh, uh, any new technology and the need for identifying and addressing it. Uh, the uh, Niti Aayog has taken two major initiatives in this direction, uh, which I would like to highlight. Uh, first of all, uh, in collaboration with iSpirit, the data empowerment and production architecture was released uh, that enables uh, data sharing at the same time um, uh, you know, ensuring a very strong data protection and enabling data empowerment. This is consent based data sharing. And we feel that, uh, you know, since privacy uh, is an important part of any uh, uh, um, uh, use of uh, AI and uh, responsible AI, uh, and especially in AI, uh, we use these, um, um, uh, you know, uh, individual data. Unless we have this system of data sharing, we will really be uh, throwing away uh, the baby with the bathwater if we do not have systems and frameworks in place to ensure uh, data sharing in a very transparent manner uh, and in a trustworthy manner. So in, in my view, this is one of the uh, very important initiatives taken by, uh, uh, by Niti Ayo. And uh, presently, we are actually propagating this architecture uh, both in uh, EU countries with you, with Australia, with the UK, and we are uh, performing collaborations on how this can, we can take this uh, at a, uh, to a global level. So this is one point I wanted to uh, emphasize. The other is on, um, you know, identifying, coming out with strategy, because awareness on a responsible AI, uh, what is a responsible AI? What are the ethical issues that we feel is lacking, not only uh, uh, you know, in uh, uh, not only in industry, industry may be uh, more aware, but any any way in all segments, whether industry, academy, or government, the awareness is lacking. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, seeing that, and uh, we highlighted it in the uh, strategy document also last year, we came out with two decks, different decks for seeking uh, stakeholder consultation. The first one was on principles for responsible AI, and the second one was on enforcement. On the principal part, we have actually concluded the uh, stakeholder consultation as well as interministerial con consultation, which is very important for any uh, government body to kind of, uh, you know, issue any kind of paper. And uh, this paper was released earlier in the year, uh, in 2021, where we have identified seven major uh, principles uh, uh, which we feel need to be followed for, uh, you know, and these are uh, what India is kind of uh, uh, proposing as the seven principles of safety and reliability, equality, uh, inclusivity and non-discrimination, privacy and security, transparency, accountability, etc. Uh, so this is one part, but having principles is one thing and, you know, generally it is easier to uh, get some kind of a consensus on principles, but uh, translating these principles uh, is into, you know, reliable enforcement mechanisms so to uh, which will ensure that uh, AI promotes equity, safety and privacy of not only the citizens, uh, uh, of India, but you know, uh, when these tools go abroad, then across you know global level also, that is uh, the tricky part, and uh, that is where uh, you know Niti Aayog is presently undertaking consultations, uh, both with experts as well as within the government. So 
I would not like to go through uh, that part too much at mm-hmm. this uh, at, at this stage because that is still under consultation. But the challenge of uh, remains that ensuring that the AI ecosystem is developed responsibility is complex. It's there is no easy answer. Um, and uh, you know, around the world, globally, we have seen various countries and organizations have identified gui- guiding principles to align the stakeholders towards uh, responsible management of AI. Individual entities, even industry research uh, institutes, have taken their uh, on their own, you know, initiatives to work towards responsible AI. Uh, however, given that AI and technological advancements in general have these blurred international boundaries. We also need to ensure that we create, uh, you know, uh, uh, greater frameworks for international co- cooperation to advance uh, AI innovation and share practices and resources to defend against any malign use of this technology, uh, which also is something which uh, the NSAI is advocating and which is also something uh, which we have been saying. Uh, and uh, now, we, you know, this is also being uh, mm-hmm. uh, discussed in various multilateral fora like GIFA and all. As regards right. uh, the potential for international collaboration... Uh, I if think, I can... Yeah, if, yeah. You, if you wrap up, we'll just uh, want to get quickly to the other two speakers. Uh, and, and Okay, so, so basically international collaboration, point, yeah. collaboration, there is a lot of, uh, lot of uh, you know, uh, scope available. So I, I feel, uh, uh, you know, this is the area of research where countries can actually come together and, uh, you know, invest in this. Thank you. Sorry for over. Thank you. <laughs> No, it's fine. It's um, getting late, I know, for in particularly in Australia and Japan, but uh, uh, Amb- uh, Ambassador Fikin, um, if I can turn to you, uh, you, you were interested in speaking on uh, Australia's approach to international cooperation on AI, including through the Quad. And if I can actually tuck in a question from one of uh, the participants, which is, are the specific strengths that the other Quad members, in your view, bring to the table? Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've noticed how many questions have been coming up during uh, the uh, d- during the various uh, interventions by by everyone, um, so good that you got one in there. Um, look, the, the main guidance for the way that we're engaging internationally on any uh, cyber or tech issue right now is uh, has been. Uh, we just recently released, uh, on twenty first of April, my minister released our international cyber and critical tech engagement strategy, and that gives a real overarching framework of how we're looking to um, interact with partners with. Uh, with industry, with NGOs, with anyone who's interested in what Australia's position is, you'll find it there. And really at its core is, and and it's been really interesting listening to other interventions, the core of this strategy is talking about values and and what are the values that that we want to see embodied by technology, if you like, baked into technology design, um, but also what kinds of values do we want to see technology absorbed into and, you know, the, the global setting, the standard setting. Um, and, and of course, that that includes all sorts of things that we've already been discussing around ethics and, and democratic principles. Um, anyone's interested, if they go to internationalcybertech.gov.au, they can find uh, the, the full length version of, of that strategy. Um, and as you'd expect, you know, we're advocating for a whole range of things, but I know you and you, you really would like to hear a little bit more um, about, about the kind of perspective on the quad. I mean, I would say something that we need to be really mindful of here is that, you know, the, the discussions on uh, AI principles, ethics are happening in a whole range of forums. Um, and we really need to be sharp eyed on that as, as uh, global governments and make sure we're in there. At the moment, we're undergoing a negotiation at UNESCO. Um, on developing recommendations on the ethics of AI and, and not giving too much away from uh, those negotiations, but you can very much see the same geopolitical trends that you spot at a you know an international negotiation on cyberspace, on laws and, and norms are in cyberspace playing out now in that arena as well. So uh, yeah, there's there's a there's a certainly uh, a charge there. Now I really liked um, the the percentage of GDP figures that we were given there. You know, the the quad market forces are considerable um, where we find commonality of cause. So, you know, you'd have seen recently the leader's statement made uh, the announcement of an emerging critical and emerging tech working group, um, which was established, which, you know, is an additional cooperative mechanism um, on a whole range of emerging technologies, including AI. and I think if, if we can bind ourselves properly 
through collective engagement, um, through looking at statements of commonality of cause, values, and acknowledging that not everything is going to be aligned and, and the world would be a boring place, wouldn't it, if we all agreed too violently. But, um, you know, those are going to be very powerful mechanisms going forward. Um, and standard setting is a key priority of that working group of bringing our various standards setting bodies together um, and, you know, again, finding that common narrative um, and, and having had a lot of experience myself of sitting in various standards organizations like the International Telecom Telecommunications Union, there's certainly a narrative that authoritarian governments have spun, which is very much listened to. Um, and that's something that we need to be not only aware of, but think of what our proposition is. What is the proposition we're taking to these organizations to make sure that, um, you know, our values, our principles are very much there because they're good values, they're good principles that we're, we're looking to um, embody and we do embody uh, these organizations. Um, and I think, you know, the AI standards setting place will be absolutely um, vital going forward. So that can be one of the areas of, of uh, uh, you know, additional productivity um, to the question that you asked. Um, but I think we should also look for joint opportunities as well as, you know, through the quad constructs. The quad often gets, you know, is, is, is often perceived through a very much a security lens. I think it's now showing that it's got much broader utility. Um, but, you know, this is an opportunity to jointly push back on applications of AI that um, impinge on human rights, violate international law and undermine, still on that, that security side, but undermine international peace and security. If we look further forward, though, in terms of what the Quad could do, um, and and you know, not to go too far out and spinning policy <laughs> on a on a on a call, but I think you know we can look to deepen the research and development cooperation um, for broad-based and collaborative AI research, and I think that's something that um, if you if you combine that that you know that GDP power, the collective mindsets that we have, if we start looking at ways that we can do joint R and D across our four countries, I think then, then you could bring some real power to bear. Um, I'll just say a couple of final things before I hand back to you. Um, there was a report which ORF were involved in very clearly, something called the Quad Tech Network, um, and, and there was a, a CNAS recommendation, uh, who was one of the partner uh, organizations that the Quad could create a multilateral version of the US Nas National Research Cloud, which is an interesting idea. Um, if you kind of think of the idea of pooling of standardized data sets from our four countries could really facilitate training and machine learning models. And I think one of our previous speakers might have mentioned something similar as well. You know, the, the power of AI come, will, will, will come from um, in, increased quantities of data. And if, if we can find a mechanism for um, pooling data and, 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 you know, overcome some of the obvious barriers that might exist there, um, then, then that's another area that the Quad can really um, uh, add value, I think. But, you know, these, these are all opportunities that I think um, are there for the taking through the Quad um, and just really, you know, project our commitment to that shared liberal democratic value or the, or the shared liberal democratic values uh, that we want to see um, technology embody. So, you know, now is a time of great excitement in the Quad. There's a lot going on um, and a lot of potential. Um, but that's why conversations like this are really important, because now is also a really important time for the think tank community, for the research community, um, to make sure that, you know, you're, you're pushing governments along um, and, and giving good food for thought that we can then take into our discussion. So thanks very much and, and really appreciate the opportunity um, to share some thinking. Thank you. I'll, I'll uh, thank you for that, and I'll have uh, we're almost out of time, so I'm just going to uh, turn to Jason for for the last word and last question, uh, and I'll try and tuck in some uh, some of the questions that came in from uh, the audience. But uh, before uh, signing off, I also uh, a, num a number of panelists have mentioned various reports that their governments have put out or that other actors have put out, and what we will try to do when we when we do feature this conversation in uh, you know on our website and and on uh, uh, other for for formats, including social media, we'll try and. Uh, pull those together so so that it becomes a resource for everybody else uh, to to access that information from the various governments and from uh, various recommendations, um, including of course the NSC AI report. Uh, but final word to 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 Jason, um, the Quad leaders, as has been mentioned, have created a critical and emerging technology working group. It has met now. Um, how do you think, based on that, the Quad nations can work together to develop 
um, uh, various lines we've heard about R&D, but also telecom technologies and align efforts to protect critical supply chain, which has been another area of uh, interest. Yeah, I, I think probably the most important thing I can say is that we should all, when this is uh, posted, um, replay Tobias's uh, last few minutes of remarks. I just thought they were brilliant and, and spot on. So I'm deeply grateful to him. Uh, on supply chains, the White House just released a supply chain review, which is posted publicly. It's 250 pages long, so not a short report. Uh, but just to give the spoiler, the review emphasizes that the U.S. will not achieve supply chain security alone. Uh, we have to achieve it collectively with our allies and partners. And the report calls out the Quad specifically uh, recommending expanding multilateral engagement on supply chain vulnerabilities, um, especially through the Quad and through the G7. Uh, recommends convening a global forum on supply chain resilience. Um, and then the review calls out the quad discussions of semiconductor supply chains that uh, many on the screen and in the participant list have been involved in. One of the supply chains that we're especially concerned about are the critical minerals used in semiconductors. And the U.S. is especially eager to work with the quad on developing strategies for those minerals, looking at existing approaches to mining, processing, and recycling, but also looking at fundamentally new approaches to cleaner and safer processing, uh, such as biomining. Uh, Michelle Rosso here at the National Security Council has been leading some of that work with the Quad, and so I'm I'm really grateful to those who have been participating here, and look forward to it continuing. Um, to your questions on 5G, I would I would uh, uh, defer to Gilman entirely. Uh, he literally, you know, wrote the report on this with the Defense Innovation Board's report on 5G. So uh, back to you. Well, thank you. I, I think there's a lot more that we can discuss. I think we just hit the, the tip of the iceberg, but it just leaves it to me now uh, for a few minutes over to thank uh, all the panelists for, uh, in many cases, staying up very late or waking up very early in the morning to join us. Uh, thanks to, we had uh, at any given time over 60 participants. So thanks to all of you uh, for uh, joining us. And thanks to the National Security Commission on AI and to my colleagues at ORF America for putting this together. Uh, with that, I uh, hope you can join us and you'll hear uh, more in terms of summaries and, and uh, updates from this uh, roundtable. Hopefully we'll have a lot more on AI uh, out of ORF America in the coming year. Thank you again for joining us.